everyone. Welcome again to tonight's straight. Hi talk. there. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. Okay, so this is real time. We're actually live. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> okay. Take two. I am sorry about that. It's okay. okay. Okay, Pam, Pam, as we say in TV, uh, take it again. Okay. <laughs> five, four, I'm going to count you down. Five, four, three. Hi, everyone. Welcome again to tonight's Straight Talk for our online community forum. I'm Pam Duncan, and I am the CEO of Metropolitan Development Council. We are joined as always by Amanda Westbrook, who is our facilitator for our conversations. Ms. Amanda. Why, thank you, Ms. Pam. Tonight's conversation is the 43rd in a series of discussions. Started last year where we hold weekly discussions. Yeah, major pat on the back for all of us here. Um, about around important topics impacting our communities in Tacoma and Pierce County. And take it away, Ms. Pam. Mm -hmm. And tonight, we will be discussing how our community has responded to the ongoing pandemic and what funders are doing now to help with that response. And remember, the most important thing about this series of conversations is always that there is a thread of hope for our community throughout everything that we talk about. Ms. Amanda. Yes, indeed. We want to gratefully acknowledge that we rest on the traditional lands of the Puyallup people where they make their home and speak the Lachute Seed language. Throughout tonight's conversation, you can submit questions to be addressed by our speakers using the Q&A function in Zoom. We cannot promise that we will get to every question, but we will make our best effort to get through the list in our allotted time. Now, drum roll, please. Ah, there it is. I would like to introduce our guest for tonight's conversation, someone who is beloved in Pierce County, and everybody wants a coffee with her. I'm talking about Donna Ponapito. She is the CEO of United Way of Pierce County. Donna, thank you for being here today. Nice to be here. Thank you. You're more than welcome, my dear. Well, let's get started like we do every week um, with a check-in on how everyone is doing in their heart. And when I say everyone, I also want to include Rob Huff. He is the Director of Advocacy and Communications for MDC and also produces this weekly show in a very elegant, seamless way. So how is your heart tonight, you three? Or if this is a better phrase for you, what are you currently processing? And I'll let you go when the spirit moves you to speak up. Well, I will start. Um, I am actually doing well. Um, you know, I know we're gonna be talking about it a little bit later on, but you know, I've been a part of the Pierce County Connected you know, for uh, over a year. And today was our last meeting. Um, and we took, we spent the whole time just doing some reflection. And I just don't think that we give ourselves enough time to reflect. And it was nice to take an hour and a half and just think about, you know, what, you know, what we learned over the last year. So it was, um, it was just really nice, calming, a sense of hope, hopefulness as well. Well, then this is good timing because we have so many good things to say about that coalition. So I like to say, first of all, Donna, I am so glad that you are able to join us this evening, even though you will be officially um, interviewed by Miss Amanda and um, introduced as well, but I'm, I'm just really excited about your being here. I, I actually had a very different response in terms of what's 
um, how my heart is and what I'm reflecting on. And that is uh, really the, um, the national discourse mm -hmm. around um, policing and how communities of color, especially black men are so um, gravely impacted. That's, that's the thing that's on my mind right now. And I was thinking, Donna, as you were speaking, wow, it has been a year and this today was actually your last meeting. And how much has happened from the time that uh, the funders first began this work. So I'm also yeah. very eager to hear what you will be sharing. Thank you, Pam. And I'll weigh in and say that um, like a lot of the weeks when we ask this question, I feel kind of pulled in different directions. I think um, there's, it feels like it's a time to be hopeful in some fronts, especially around COVID-19 and, and how um, now everyone is eligible to get a vaccine and there's an opportunity for us to actually take some actions as individuals to, um, allow things to come back to a more um, even keel and hopefully better than what normal was before COVID. Um, but I'm torn because of, as Pam mentioned, a lot of the national news, um, the fact that a jury is now considering the, the case in Minnesota um, and that we continue to see these ongoing um, mass shootings around our community, around the country. Um, there's a lot to think about. And I guess I'm trying to find glimpses of hope amongst those things that we need to think and work on. Mm. Beautifully said, Rob. Yeah, there's a lot to process. There's a lot of trauma going on in our country right now. Um, I think we're just starting to see how traumatized everybody in this whole world has been for the past year. Donna, last year, our community responded to COVID-19 by pooling resources and making decisions about what kinds of services needed funded in the community differently for that time. Trying to pull it all together and focus resources to help the community get through this pandemic that none of us had any kind of dress rehearsal for. How did that work at the United Way? What was the United Way's role in this? Yeah, you, you know, when, when everything shut down, <laughs> uh, March, around March 13th, I think it was, when we closed our office, um, immediately, you know, thought about the partnerships that needed to happen. Um, and that is when, you know, Kathy and I, uh, Kathy Lippman with Greater Tacoma Community Foundation, you know, had the first of many conversations about, all right, you know what, we're, we're going to be better together to figure this out and to figure out how we can address these needs and how can we pull together the, uh, what, uh, you know, we have called this aligned philanthropy and, and as opposed to having, you know, all the different philanthropies allocate dollars out, United Way give dollars out, or, or Greater Tacoma Community Foundation do that, how can we pull everyone together uh, and make a greater impact uh, and do that in a way that removes all of any barriers that we may have put up <laughs> beforehand, you know, in all of our different processes, but to say, you know, if there's some urgent needs out there, you know, what are those key urgent needs? They were around um, housing, uh, childcare, affordable childcare. I mean, that was the biggest, uh, one of the biggest things, um, food and food. Uh, you know, those, those were the three initial buckets um, that we saw. And so working with my team, and the relationships that we have with nonprofit agencies, we were able to assess very quickly um, who's doing what, what are the nonprofits on the ground seeing, um, so that then we could take that information and just make some very um, 
uh, quick decisions up front. You know, we called it rapid, uh, rapid funding, urgent funding, and we got that out within the first week. I think we got out a million dollars. Um, and you know, when you think about funders. <laughs> That doesn't happen very often where, uh, and United Way included, where we get money out that quickly. And so, you know, saying to ourselves, what do we want to make sure our values around really addressing the most immediate needs? And one was that it needed to be equitable. We needed to pay attention to um, geographic equity, racial equity, size of organizations. Uh, we needed to look at making this a transparent process and keeping it simple. And, and so those, so, and United Way's role in that was ensuring that we were getting the voice of the community into Pierce County Connected. You know, our 211 immediately part of the statewide 211 call system started taking phone calls from the, the um, Department of, State Department of Health. Uh, what they did is they contracted with Washington 211 and you know we started we were really on call for almost a year from 6 a.m till 10 o'clock at night taking phone calls around um, COVID-19 uh, so they were busy doing that you know and then we were also working with the county you know to it, it was it was really the lines of communication, keeping all the lines of communication and sharing of information so that there was a, the least amount of duplication as possible. I have to tell you, I was on the on the inner outside of this in terms of some of the emails that went out um, and some of the um, that phrase boots on the ground. You and your team quickly put together an infrastructure that looked like um, a pyramid scheme of the best kind. And that was that I remember every day at two o'clock, Erica Tucci sending out these emails going, get your reports in, who needs what? I couldn't believe how fast this turned around. I mean, it was just, it was so admirable. It took your breath away. Um, and it also makes you look at how quickly money can be distributed. Mm -hmm. and go, hmm also at that case. So Donna, have you sensed a change in the needs in our community over this last year? I mean, overall, how do you think the community has responded? When we first started the whole process of trying to impact, get dollars out into the community, we had this nice linear process, you know, it was going to be, all right, we were going to put money out there for urgent needs, um, you know, the most urgent. And then we we're going to talk about and what's emerging from this, you know, and focus on emerging. And then the next phase was going to be, okay, we're going to see light at the end of the tunnel. What's the next step, you know, the kind of the reimagining. And what we found is that uh, it was urgent the entire way through. I mean, there were certainly some emerging things, you know, and wanting to see. Well, one of the things that we did see is that um, organizations were were working together. You know, they were they were supporting each other, collaborating, looking at different ways to partner. So I thought that that was really um, that was good, and I hope that continues. Um, but overall, in terms of the change of needs, I mean, technology, you know, I mean, where technology is, is not a, to me, is, is moved beyond being a luxury. Technology is a need, you know, I mean, we realize that, you know, with kids, you know, learning from home, um, you know, with, you know, families, you know, and actually it didn't even matter your socioeconomic level, because if you've got kids at home, online and you're trying to work, you're gonna have internet problems, right? Um, and so technology became a, you know, a really huge issue. Uh, uh, the um, offsite learning, you know, um, and, and the children uh, where parents couldn't stay at home, 
you know, and, you know, the, the way that Green Trike and others came together to create collaborations so that children had a place, you know, where they could continue to do their schoolwork and be in a, in a safe uh, environment. Um, so those, you know, those things, you know, were some of the, some of the issues that we saw continue. Hunger, you know, food insecurity continues to be it's, yeah, it's unbelievable how much that is, st it's still a major, major um, issue. And of course, we all know about housing affordability. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was an issue before the pandemic. Um, it And yet, yes, there's moratoriums right now. But from what I understand, even with the moratoriums, there are still people uh, being, um, it, trying to get be, at least be evicted from, from the stories that I'm hearing. It's not stopping um, folks from, uh, landlords from uh, trying to get, you know, folks uh, evicted. Uh, so I think the affordable housing issue is, is just, it, it has been exacerbated. You know, I think too, one of the, well, you know, the other thing, in fact, we talked about this today at Pierce County Connected meeting, you know, we knew beforehand um, the racial disparities. This, you know, uh, with this pandemic, with all of the, you know, the racial injustice, you know, with the George, from the George Floyd mur murder to Manny Ellis, you know, to, you know, just what has happened, you know, in the last couple of weeks. I mean, we, with all of those issues, the, the, the racial, um, the racial awareness and the need to address these issues um, with the pandemic and the disproportionate number of people of color that have been, you know, that have, you know, gotten the, you know, gotten COVID, have died from COVID, uh, and then now we're seeing the vaccination, you know, the disparities there. And how, and, but at the same time, now I think there's a greater awareness that these disparities are there. So how do we educate communities and make sure, and that's the last thing that we did as a Pierce County Connected is allocated uh, resources to um, uh, organizations serving the BIPOC communities for the most part uh, to make sure that they are able to get information out to communities so that they'll get vaccinated. And you know, working with Multicare and other places as well to get the shots in the arms, but you can't get the shots in the arms if people aren't going to the places, right? And so uh, that was our last uh, last uh, job as a Pierce County Connected is to get resources to those organizations to be able to help them do that. Donna, um, what you everything that you said was is a reminder of what we were seeing evolve, it was like, just think of everything that is so unlikely that would be an issue and just throw that on into this pandemic pot and we're just gonna stir it up and it's just everything, just everything, right? <laughs> yes. You just wouldn't, if, if whatever, doesn't matter if you think it has anything to do with anything else, there's gonna be an intersection. Yeah. So I'm gonna go back to one of the things that uh, you, one of the first things you mentioned that really got elevated is the, uh, the critical uh, nature and our reliance on technology. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I smiled as you talked about anyone with kids knows that <laughs> your phone <laughs> call is going to freeze up. Um, but what has, what has been the uh, conversation about really elevating now um, the acquisition of broadband for, for all. And that, yeah. that's just a very organic question that came to me as uh, you were just talking about what you saw emerge. Yeah, you know, and I think it's, I don't have the answer. Um, I think it's still a conversation, um, you know, because it's, you know, ultimately, you know, what are, you know, are the, the companies that provide that service, right? Um, I know some of the things that we funded, you know, allowed for different communities to be able to provide, you know, um, 
broadband and increase that uh, to some of, to, you know, to residents in their communities. Um, but I think that that is, uh, um, it, is an, uh, it, it is something that we have to keep at top of mind, keep having the conversation because um, it, you know, it's another layer of disparity you know, in, a, in our communities. And, and you think about uh, like, um, for instance, we funded a couple of places in uh, Franklin Pierce, not Franklin Pierce, I'm sorry, um, Key Penn and in Franklin Pierce too, but in Key Penn in particular, I'm thinking that uh, we funded, I believe one of the fire departments to be able to have them provide access to the internet for folks coming into the, you know, in the par parking lot, uh, basically. Um, so, you know, those are only band-aids to a bigger issue uh, that uh, I wish I had the answer for, but I don't. That was a great question, Pam. Yes. So I have two questions. Actually, I have, I have a statement and then I have a question. <laughs> So I was uh, talking with some colleagues about um, uh, they run nonprofits and um, a couple of their funders had very designated funds when COVID hit, they were going to give them. And um, they got on the horn and talked with these funders and said, can you make these a general fund for us and found that many of them said yes. You know, I mean, it's like it's one thing to have money put aside for a new printer, but if nobody's in the office, you know, can we move that over to maybe pay some payroll or pay some utility bills or something mm -hmm. like this? So Donna, it leads me into the question of at this point, are you expecting that funders or programs in our community are likely to shift back to something resembling those pre-pandemic days? And then how do you see funding priorities being different now? You know, that is a, that's a really good question. Um, you know, the, yeah, you were absolutely right. I think with, you know, during the pandemic funders were very, you know, we, you know, we didn't provide, uh, we didn't uh, require organizations to provide us data you know, we were able to talk to the city of Tacoma and they agreed, you know, to do the same as well. Um, as we come out of this, um, you know, my, my hope is that we make some changes. My fear is we go back to the same, right? And I know that as United Way, I've been having discussions with my team to say, okay, you know, we ask for these reports, what is it we really need, you know, um, and can we just get down to the bare, you know, the basics in terms of what is the information we need to tell the story? Um, and, and so, you know, we're, we're doing our best to walk the talk, uh, but still needing information, you know, and I, and I think the other thing that, um, you know, we talked about and, and you know, Kathy Lippman, you know, is, you know, great partner, we're great partners, she talks about this whole idea of trust-based philanthropy, mm -hmm. you know, where you fund an organization for something and you just trust. And now it doesn't free them up for giving, you know, you any, any information, but what you say is, and this is what really how we did the Pierce County Connected Fund. We didn't require any reports. Now, what I think what we're doing is culling some stories from it, um, and but we didn't require any reporting. You know, the application process. Um, it was as Pam, you your your agency filled out one of those applications. It was basically two questions. I think it was three, and you know, we needed some checkoff boxes. You know, to population stuff like that. But the application itself was. I mean, wh uh, what is your emerging need? You know, what do you need the funds for? And I think there was one other question in there. So, um, yeah, there's still a lot of um, foundations out there that, that ask for data. You know, they ask for data. So I don't think we can escape it, but I hope we're smarter about it. 
You know, I mean, if not, and I want my United Way to be smarter about the data um, that we ask for. Um, I, the, the prior, and my hope is as we look at future priorities that we keep in mind that it really is about the impact and the story. And while, you know, I have a goal of lifting 15,000 house, households out of poverty by 2028, I've got to collect some data, right? right. <laughs> I've, I've got to collect something. Um, you know, what is it I need to collect to tell that story? Uh, yes. So yeah, I, I, I hope we don't go back completely to pre-pandemic. But uh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping that we don't, but I, I, do, I do think um, that if, as we look at you know, future funding cycles, that we see that we were just as successful, you know, not asking for all the information that we used to ask for, not taking months and months and months to make decisions, that we can make decisions pretty rapidly. Right. When we, when we want to, right? When we have to. Yes. And, and I, I'm sitting here, I'm looking at Pam and thinking about um, the huge organization that MDC is and their wraparound services and all that, all the giving that you do. Pam, has any of your paperwork changed since this to make it um, much more streamlined than well, I need you to send me a spreadsheet. Oh, I'm sorry, you don't have a laptop? <laughs> the, um, hmm. Well, it really depends on the organization to whom we, we are reporting. Uh, as Donna mentioned, the application process for Pierce County Connected uh, was surprisingly very straightforward and simple. And even with some of the other funders, for example, and I, this conversation wasn't necessarily about any one particular funder, but uh, with the Pierce County um, CARES dollars that came in, um, those, I was very surprised at the process, the, the application itself, almost similar to the one that uh, Donna is referencing, just a couple of questions. Um, the reporting, there actually, it has been very different. Um, and I, I mean, actually, I really have to think about it because we've all been so focused on much higher level things that you know, that's why I had the expression on my face of mm -hmm. reporting, what <laughs> reporting, but um, that, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, uh, that has been a big difference um, from the, as a result of the pandemic. Yeah, I mean, you certainly, Pam and Donna, report out at a different level uh, than somebody who's just taking an intake application. Um, a basic one, but I find it really compelling to think about in my mind a ladder or a moral arc of justice mm -hmm. and to see where that application process used to sit and the barriers it included and encouraged. And then COVID comes along and we, as Donna said, very simple needs, housing, food, child care and suddenly we have distilled this down into these are our basic needs for us to get up every morning and to say hello and try to survive through this so it would make sense that the process either a high level or just having food is free carts on the corner of the street mm -hmm. to make it that accessible and that quicker so when we think about some of those big lessons that we've learned, and I'd, I'd love to have Pam and Rob weigh out on this too. The biggest lesson from the Tacoma Pierce County pandemic that you all have responded to, what is that biggest lesson? I know that's a hard question because there's so many. And as Donna beautifully said, you know, 
I don't want to go back. When you said going back to normal, do we go back? And I think there's some things I don't want to go back to. You know, I want to stay awake. I don't want to go back to that. Mm -hmm. So how do we continue to physically heal from COVID, but also spiritually eradicate racism at the same time? I want to just uh, respond to what have we learned. And I think actually everything that Donna has expressed already really speaks to something that we've learned. We can figure things out. Mm -hmm. We can, we, yeah. we can <laughs> like in a crisis, we can figure it out and not make, um, not add a ton of bureaucracy to the process. That was the first thing that came to my mind. It's, it's, we can do this. Yes. And if we can do this, there are a lot of other thises that we can do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. I just wanted to give Donna a chance to uh, sip on her. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I know it's my tea. I'm so <laughs> I have been, I've been in meetings all day. Um, so yeah, lesson, I totally agree, uh, Pam. I, I think that, uh, you know, we, um, especially the funding community at times, we, we make it so challenging. And, you know, we were able to just strip away all of that. The other thing, the lesson I think, um, you know, learned from this past year, is um, that we're a pretty resilient community. Um, you know, we, you know, you know, yes, there was funds out there, but organizations were also out there figuring it out. I mean, when you look at the nonprofits, you know, we did a survey in collaboration with the county, you know, lots of nonprofits, you know, some saying, yeah, you know, we can hang in there for six months, a year, you know, but really worried about the state of their, their organizations. But, you know, you really haven't heard of anyone, you know, closing their doors. Um, they, you know, were resilient. Uh, they figured it out because they wanted to do what was best for their, their clients. Um, and then I think too, the power of partnership. Um, you know, there, there was a lot of partnerships that came out of this. Um, and, you know, we weren't tripping the, the beauty of all of this, if we can say there's beauty in this, um, is that there wasn't a lot of tripping over each other. You know, and um, in terms of what needed to happen, I mean, you had the, the county and the various, you know, kind of their command structure, you know, and working overall with the county, you had Pierce County connected and, and the command structure there that was led by Erica Tucci, you know, with the Cheney Foundation. Uh, then you had all the layers under that. Um, you had, uh, you know, 211, you know, system, uh, and then the, um, the, the system where, you know, we were kind of the volunteer system. So United Way also took a role in kind of overseeing, you know, people who wanted to volunteer. So th there was, there was something kind of magical, how everyone kind of stepped in and leaned into their role. Um, and they did what everyone did what they did best. Um, and it, as a result, uh, while there's still many, many challenges, um, I, I do think that it, it gave us an opportunity to do some things differently and hopefully learn from what we were doing before that didn't work. And then, you know, move ahead, you know, as because we're still in it, you know, we're still in this pandemic. Uh, and, you know, now we're back into stage two, you know, phase two. So we're, we're here and it, it's not over uh, for so many, for, for any of us. You know? uh, and uh, so we're still, you know, looking to see how can we continue to take some of those lessons that we learned throughout last year uh, and keep them going forward. Mm -hmm. Rob, you, your title, Director of Advocacy and Communications, and I know that one of your huge strengths is that you are 
an amazing listener. What lessons did you learn in your position with MDC? Well, I, I would reflect, reflect a lot of what Donna and Pam have said in terms of the ability of our community, our state to um, actually lead. Um, if you look at how, especially Washington State has handled the pandemic, uh, it th there have been plenty of flaws and plenty of perpetuated inequities that we don't know we all need to work on. But the outcomes for those in our state and in our community have been by and large better than most other parts of the country. Um, you know, I think of the, I think of the, an article I saw the other day where they were talking about if every state had responded to COVID-19 like Washington state and the Seattle area had, um, how many fewer people would have perished from COVID-19. So I think we've been fortunate that we're in a community where people, you know, do things like listen to science by, by and large um, and, and are willing to accept leadership um, and ask the hard questions and deal with the, the things that need to be answered. Um, there's a lot of room for improvement. And I think we still have a lot of um, disproportionate impact from COVID-19 and from the economic impacts of COVID-19 here, but um, but I think that we it seems we have done a little better than other parts of the country. Yeah, I would agree with that. Go ahead, Pam. Well, um, I thought you know um, it was it has been said that 2020 was the year that just elevated everything that was wrong with the world, mm -hmm. right? And um, with the pandemic, what as I was thinking about what you said, Donna, about how it was um, an opportunity for everyone to lean into their role, that um, maybe what the pandemic also has done is sh has shown us, again, like I said, we can do this, we can mm -hmm. figure things out, but that also how to, how to lean in to the, our respective roles in a crisis, how to, um, how to self-correct because mistakes will be made. And, but this isn't the time to sit and beat up on one another or our own selves because there's something so much more important at stake. And that is the, the well-being of our community. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's one of the one of the good things, you know, you've got to find the good in whatever your situation is that has come, is that we learned how to, how to correct, how to correct as we're moving along and just do it better and allow for people to step in um, into an opportunity. Yeah. Beautifully said, Pam. Mm -hmm. Hmm. You know, um, who was it? Um, Barack Obama, I think, said, and I often think this, don't let any good crisis go to waste. Hmm. I mean, so many people have said that. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me, Donna, that what you have been talking about with the funders is just that very thing. I know I would totally agree. I mean, I, I, and I'm a believer in that too. You know, it, it's like, you know, every, for every crisis, there's opportunity. Uh, and I would say as a community, you know, we didn't, um, we, we looked at this crisis, you know, right in the face and said, okay, what do we need to do? You know, <laughs> and uh, that's, you know, that's what makes me hopeful, you know, that, that some things will change as we, you know, hopefully eventually come out of this, you know, and, and think about all those things that we learned. So Donna, you, you said something that made me think of this question and that was, you said, well, you know, we're not through it yet. We're, we're now we're back into phase two. So here we have new administration, lots more money being promised 
Why would this program not continue? Why did you say goodbye to it today? Because we're not done with COVID. Well, we raised $7.8 million. Wow. Uh, we, alloca we allocated all $7.8 million uh, to 300 305 grants, uh, 216 organizations uh, in the community, and uh, with $26 million in funding requests. Uh, so all of that happened in this last year, which is phenomenal. Um, and you know, while, the, while this work is done, um, I don't think we're done working together. Um, you know, we're just thinking about, okay, what's the, the next thing that we want to, you know, focus in on? Um, because we have learned that bringing people together, especially bringing philanthropy together, um, there's good things that are come out that are going to come out of it, uh, and and so there's talk about what does you know what does the next thing look like. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, I know it was very sad for us to uh, see it you know see us kind of close this chapter, but I think that there will be other chapters. Well, it's such a beacon of efficiency that we're all like, yeah, don't stop now. Yeah. <laughs> And you know, I know that's true. And you know, what's, what's wonderful is, is you ask, you know, you say Pierce County connected and everyone knows what that, you know, who, who that is, what it is. Uh, and it was, uh, I think it was the first name that was, that we came up with and it just stuck. Uh, and so, uh, you know, who knows what's next? <laughs> We're not done partnering. <laughs> No, we're not done getting into good trouble. Right, exactly. Um, you know, when I think about the people who received funding from that huge number you put out, and then my brain goes to what you've taught me about Alice. Mm -hmm. And of course, we want to define Alice as asset limited income restrained employed. And that is a cross section of people um, that exist here in Pierce County. So in your look at the data, has the pandemic changed the situation for those Alice people who have to work two jobs just to even think about putting gas in their car? Yeah, um, I'm sure that it has. You know, we, we haven't collected all the, the information on it at this point, um, but when you think about the what Alice looks like, you know, who Alice looks like. Uh, and if they were working a couple of jobs before the pandemic, if they were teetering on the edge before the pandemic and they've lost those jobs or lost one of those jobs um, and childcare and all these other things, um, I would imagine that Alice was greatly impacted. Um, and you know the the other thing when we look at the numbers before the pandemic, you get thirty one percent of the county is Alice, Alice or in poverty. You know when you look at when you peel that number back, and you've got forty seven percent are black of Alice families are black, and forty four percent are um, Hispanic. Uh, and so, you know, we had, there were issues even before the pandemic. So I, you know, one can just imagine that the pandemic exacerbated the situation for an Alice family. Now, you know, with our Centers for Strong Families, which is that network of organization that's really about helping improve the financial well being of, of Alice families, what we found is that uh, while Alice, didn't necessarily decrease their debt during the pandemic, they were okay to some degree, at least the ones in the Centers for Strong Families, because they were able to manage that debt. You know, they were able to manage what they had and use their cash, you know, their, their income, what and whatever that income looked like to cover the, you know, rent and other things that they needed to take care of their families even though they, they, their debt stayed relatively the same, if that makes sense. Um, and so, uh, you know, Alice, I think this is gonna put an even greater hardship uh, on Alice families. 
Um, but hopefully as the economy, you know, comes back and they're able to get into jobs, because one of the things that Centers for Strong Families is all about is helping that Alice family, that Alice individual, um, you know, improve their wages, you know, so that they can decrease debt and improve credit scores and all those things that they need so that they can be more self-sufficient and be at a place that they're, um, that they're thriving. Donna, did you see in, in your research, middle class actually step into an Alice situation because of the pandemic? You know, I can't answer that. I'd have to, I'd probably, I'd have to do some uh, checking. Um, and, and I would imagine even maybe the city might have some of that information, you know, like if we looked at the city or even if the county is collecting that information, um, so I, I don't know, but I can, you know, you hear the stories, you know, you hear the stories of, of families that are struggling, um, that, you know, needed to, to access food. Um, so I, yeah, you know what, I don't know 100% the, uh, the answer to that. I would imagine that there's definitely impact. And I would say that at the Alice families are the, the growing number of families that were the food insecure, you know, that were, that are the ones, you know, uh, concerned about um, housing affordability um, and keeping a roof over their head. So uh, I think that it's just been, um, there's, I would be, wouldn't be surprised if that there are more Alice's because we were actually doing better overall. And now, um, there's uh, this, this pandemic, I would imagine that number is larger. You are muted, Amanda. So while she is, um, I, I actually have <laughs> uh, um, a, I think Amanda has a follow-up question. I, I want to ask, since we're talking about you know, what does the landscape look like? Um, and what do we know, what, what data do we have available to see who is where, what has shifted? And because we are anticipating so much additional um, funding coming into mm -hmm. the community, Donna, um, have, have you had any consideration? Um, have there been any discussions about having a dashboard so that we know where we are at least right now as a baseline, even though we could actually go back a year ago and kind of construct a baseline, but have, have you, um, has there been any discussion about that? You know, um, those are good questions, and I wish I could tell you. Yes, we have. <laughs> we no, we uh, we have not had discussions about that. We've had quite, you know, but we've asked ourselves those questions, mm -hmm. and so uh, we do because our, you know, I get asked the question. You're not the first one asking me asking that question, and so we do need to work with others. You know, I guess that there have been some surveys done at the state level. Um, and some um, other work that may be done at the county level and census. And with Alice, uh, one of the things that uh, they are working on is to take a look at what the impact was of Alice over the 2020. So all of that is in the works. Um, so that's kind of where we are right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a question that keeps, that continues to come up. And I think we have to, look at it to give ourselves some kind of a, um, a, a benchmark, you know, mm -hmm. like here's mm -hmm. where we were before, here's, and, you know, here's kind of where we are now, you know, did, how far did we slip back, you know, and mm -hmm. who knows, maybe we didn't slip back as far as we thought, you know, but um, I, I have a feeling it's those, those Alice families that were probably closer to the uh, federal poverty level, you know, where we're probably, I would imagine, more severely impacted than those that may have been closer to the 200% of poverty level. And mm -hmm. the, the 
at the federal poverty level, it's around 25,000 for a family of four, I believe. So I think those Alice families that were closer to that edge probably are the ones that were more um, greatly impacted. I think it's a conversation that merits further. Yes. Um, it's an issue that merits further yeah. exploration. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. So let's make sure we have it. <laughs> That's yeah. hey, done. Get done. <laughs> so Donna, I bet at nighttime you lay awake and you can count off the steps before COVID that you used to focus on to move Alice individuals out of that category. What do you think about now, today, as we're in phase two of moving those people out of that category at this point? Yeah, you know, pretty much the same things I did before, but I think there's an even greater urgency. Yes. Um, I think the, there's a greater urgency to, you know, how do you make sure, you know, because, you know, families that are Alice have hopes and dreams, right? And so, you know, the work that we're trying to do with our partners out in the community is how do you help people achieve those hopes and dreams? Uh, and so, you know, I, I think about the same things, but I also know that there's probably some added barriers as a result of COVID and um, making sure that we're working with partners like Workforce Central and, you know, um, uh, other employers, you know, are people getting connected to the, um, it, the employment out there that will help them, you know, make um, a livable wage to take care of their families, to weather um, a, a pandemic, you know, I mean, you know, who would have thought that it would be a year later, right? Um, and so, you know, how, how do you help Alice families prepare for that? You know, they talk about there's the statistic that most families that just, I forget the percentage that don't have, you know, $400, you know, for to weather a crisis. So, you know, perhaps as we, you know, move out of this is, you know, helping to make sure Alice families do have that cushion, you know, that, that they are, you know, putting aside because, you know, with Alice, it's about survival. You know, it's paycheck to paycheck. So how can we, and the organizations that we're working with, help those Alice families and not even, they, you don't even have to be in a program, you know, in an agency program, someone who's an Alice family, how do we um, help them be able to set aside resources, you know, for, um, you know, emergencies and, you know, where it's, you know, it's, it may not be a lot, but, you know, could they, could, could we build um, savings into, you know, um, a budget, no matter what you, you make, um, because we know how important just having that extra, you know, income, you know, that extra cash is in a time of an emergency. <laughs> or not, emer yeah, this was an emergency at a time of a, you know, a situation like a, a pandemic that no one thought, you know, when we shut down, we thought we were shutting down for what, you know, a couple of months, you know, a month. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Pam, do you have anything you want to add to that before I ask our last question of all three of you? No, I, I mean, Donna has just really expressed, you know, so much so very well um, that no. <laughs> All right. Well, as we do uh, every week, we close our time together with this question. And this is a question for all three of you. Um, I'm going to ask, where are you finding hope this week? And you can jump in as you feel the spirit move you. Well, I can jump in. I, I would just say that um, I'm finding hope in the good things that I've seen from the last year. Um, it does feel like this is kind of a time for a passage. Um, I think straight talk started right around this time last year. 
Um, and we've had a lot of conversations about the challenges of this time. It just seems like there are glimmers of hope all around if you're willing to look for them. And, you know, I keep just coming back to people can get vaccinated. People have an opportunity to kind of guide their path um, because of that action. And, you know, I'm looking forward to all of my friends being able to um, safely get together again. Yes, absolutely. Well, I kind of, when I started uh, my remarks earlier this evening about Pierce County Connected, um, you know, and this being kind of our last, you know, meeting, and we did a lot of reflection, I spent the entire time reflecting. Um, I, that's, it really gave me hope in listening to the other funders and, and that were around our Zoom call share their reflections. Um, and it made me hopeful that um, in times like these, uh, you know, we were, a, you know, that people are able to come together um, and that, uh, you know, we, we can do it in a way that um, helps the community provides that human dignity, um, you know, because there's something about that, you know, this, this crisis put a, a, you know, so many individuals and, and families in situations where they needed help. Um, and so, goodness gracious, I'm going to get emotional. <laughs> And so I can feel it. So, you know, so I think with, um, I, I'm just so, I, the group gave me a lot of hope that uh, there is a, we have a caring community um, that um, at the end of the day uh, are stronger um, and we're ready, you know? I mean, we learned a lot and that gives me hope that, you know, we, we know how to do this. We, we know how to bring people together um, and get things done and, and, and make a difference. And so that, that is what, uh, that's the hope that I found this week. I love that you got emotional. <laughs> I don't know any other way, Donna. <laughs> Pam, where are you finding hope this week? There are so many, so many things that um, are battling to come out that I, I want to say, but this is, I want to say this. I think about the staff, the team mm -hmm. at MDC and how they pressed forward. They were consistent. They were always present. There were so many tough times. There have been over the, especially this past year, but the team that comprises the MDC family, that gives me hope mm. because they just continue to do what needed to be done. And I don't think I've, said this on straight talk, um, but I just give so much kudos to my team. And they, they give me hope. And I wanna say that you are a phenomenal leader and the hope goes both ways, my dear. Donna, I wanna say thank you for joining us tonight on Straight Talk after the Zoomapalooza day that you had. <laughs> I hope you get a chance to get up and to change what you're looking at and hug your husband and you know, um, disengage from this. Yeah. Um, but for, thank you to everyone though who joined us tonight on Zoom and Facebook Live. And we encourage you to come back and join us next Monday night for another straight talk conversation and as always 
you can find information about MDC's amazing services on www.mdc-hope.org, as well as links to register for our upcoming Straight Talks and great archive shows, which will show you how much we've covered in these 43 episodes. And as I always say, Pam Duncan, drive us home and tuck us in. Amanda, that is just the funniest term. <laughs> Drive us home. <laughs> but I want to say to everyone, thank you to our listening audience. Thank you for joining us. If you're live streaming on Facebook, thank you so much. And of course, Donna, we so greatly appreciate your making the time for this conversation. This was great. And it really elevated. There, there are other things that we need to talk about. And yes. don't worry, I will be following <laughs> up. Um, but again, thank you. Everyone have a very good evening. Get out and enjoy the sunshine before it goes away. Thank you, Rob. Okay. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.